let's see, where does that work? I don't use PowerPoint much either. I'm more well, of a... Are you in uh, slideshow mode? If you're in slideshow mode, I think you can just hit a down arrow and it'll advance and then an up arrow and it should go back. On your, on your keyboard, try hitting the down arrow or the page down, one of those works. See, I, on, on my keyboard, I have a little four arrow. There, now you can, now, okay, so that proves you can do that, okay. Well, at this point, I'm going to just start the meeting and if others show up, oh, wait a minute, Karen Liptak just showed, all right. So I'm going to start the meeting now, and we are thrilled and honored to have a representative of the great Kingdom of Denver fandom, <laughs> Tay Hageman, who is very qualified and is all the people in Denver are very smart. I know that because I lived there for a year. And he's going to give us a, sort of a retrospective on the great astronomical and science fiction artist and narrative artist. We use that term now, Tay, instead of illustrator, because that was kind of a put down, fine art up here, illustrators down there. So now we say he was a narrative artist of science fiction and astronomical subject matter. So anyway, uh, I know that you're a big student of these retro uh, historical painters and artists within our science fiction domain. Do you have anything else you want to say about yourself before you launch into your talk about Chesley? I'll turn it over to you. Well, uh, my uh, my background has kind of been more in the technical aspect of stuff. I've uh, haven't really had a career. I've made a career out of not having a career. A lot of job, a lot of job hopping, and. Uh, doing different things. So I, over the years, I've picked up uh, computer programming and CAD modeling and animation, uh, high vacuum solar panel construction, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and my uh, exposure with science fiction, we've had Denver used to have a Starfest convention that I'd go to once in a while. And I used to go to Mile High Condits here in Denver. And I'm a member of the uh, DASFA Science Fiction Club here in Denver. Three cheers for DASFA. That's how I heard about you. <laughs> yeah. And so my my interest has been more kind of the technical end of things you know the stuff they painted in in artwork it, you know can you really build it what would it take and would it work and so that, that's kind of my background is just a lot of uh a lot of the technical end of things well we're really interested and and thrilled to have you Oh, here comes Bruce back uh, to, to give this talk because a lot of people aren't familiar with Chesley Bonestell. So once again, I'll shut up and now we'll get into the slide area, slideshow. Okay. So I haven't done a lot of presentations before, so uh, forgive me if I kind of push the wrong buttons or something. And I was kind of envisioning this being more of a, uh, I have a, about 20, 21 slides. And I was thinking more of going through a slide and having kind of a, you know, conversation about it more than me just doing a dictation or presentation. Well, we'll do it that way then. There's no rules here. Okay. <laughs> so let's see here. There's the man himself. And Here's where I decided to start. That's uh, probably his most famous painting. And there's a, a quote down there from Kim Poor, who's another artist. He, uh, this, this painting is, she said that this, or I think it's a she, I'm not sure. The painting that launched a thousand careers. And I've seen quotes from 
engineers and technicians and so on very in various places saying yeah this is the conquest of space was kind of what got them started and that's where i first saw this book or this painting and that's one of the books i have And this is this is at the actual book I have. It's a it has a red cover, which I think is kind of unusual. Most of the ones I've seen are black. Does anybody else here have a red cover of this book? Ours is in a is in a sleeve, so I'd have to open it up and look. No. I think it's black. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't have a sleeve. Picked it up at a used bookstore somewhere. The, uh, there was a quote I saw somewhere saying that this edition was read because of a close conjunction with Mars in 1956 when this was published. I looked and looked and looked and I couldn't refine that quote, so I'm not sure if I just dreamed that or what. Uh. Now here, uh, a lot of this information came out of the book, um, The Art of Chesley Bonestell. It's a big hardback. It's got hundreds of his illustrations and paintings over the years. Mm. I highly recommend it if you're a, a fan of him or space art in general, or if uh, uh, other things. He painted architecture and he did science fiction magazine covers and advertisements. He was all over the place. And uh, he got started in art early and in uh, school, he was earning school awards. And he was actually in California with the earthquake and he had a one of his inspirations was seeing Saturn through a refractor at the Lick Observatory. And there was a bit of a family drama because his father wanted him to take over this wholesaling business. But he was more into the party scene in San Francisco. And uh, I gather from what the, they were saying in the book here that uh, he was quite the party animal. Now here I've got a link, or it's a little video that I'm gonna see if we can run here. Is that showing up? Chesley Bonestell was the greatest astronomical art. Is that showing up? It's stalling. Uh, yeah, I, I, I paused it to make sure it was actually going to. Oh, OK. All right. Go ahead. There we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chesley Bonestell was the greatest astronomical artist illustrator of all time. Whoever steps foot out onto the surface of Mars for the first time was a world that was brought to us by Chesley Bonestell decades before. Chesley Bonestell was an artist who, with his paintbrush and with his paintings, was able to show an entire nation that the conquest of space was not only possible, but it was something that could happen within their own lifetimes. I saw many of his paintings when I was a child, and they were the first visions I ever had of worlds away from Earth. And his paintings helped inspire many people who were involved in the space field, many engineers, people who were helping to get us to the moon one day, practically all of them would have been able to tell you who Chesley Bonestell was. In addition to being an artist, Chesley Bonestell was a gifted architect and lent his talents to such historic projects as the Chrysler Building and the Golden Gate Bridge. He was also a prolific illustrator for many important publications. There was no ignoring a magazine cover painted by Chesley Bonestell or the fascinating images that appeared for the articles inside. 
There isn't an artist of painting today in the science fiction fantasy field who didn't start with Chesney Barnstow. So that's a YouTube video, and you can actually see this video, which I've watched at this website. I have a link in the presentation here later. It's quite the video. You can also see it on Amazon. Oh, really? Well, that's uh, another place to go then. So he went off to study architecture at Columbia. And yeah, here's another uh, couple, of, couple of events when he was out partying. He had uh, crawled up the stairs to his place after a weekend party. And another time he drank so much that he had to be carried up on his drawing board. I can relate to that. I was, uh, I got drunk a couple of times in the Air Force, but then I decided, you know, I'm not so interested in that. But he did a lot of artwork, uh, architecture stuff. He uh, worked under an outfit in San Francisco, I think called Polk, or I'd have to look it up, but a famous architect out there. And uh, some of the buildings that he did architecture work on are actually still around. I don't know any of these buildings. Is anybody out there in the West Coast that knows these? No? This is Chris. I'm Gloria's son. I live in LA and I'm actually an architect, but I'm not familiar with any of this gentleman's work or the buildings noted here. But okay. I'm interested to look up more later on. Yeah. the. Uh, that hardback book has, has a whole section that's got, I don't know, two or three dozen different architecture illustrations. I'm thinking that uh, Blackpool, that's in Britain. So that would be, uh, that would be one of his overseas um, uh, jobs. Yeah, he was over there for several years doing stuff. Right, yeah. I immediately saw Blackpool and it, I knew that was England. <laughs> Well, was he living and working for several years in Britain? Yes, yes he was. He, uh, and he also traveled to Italy. I don't know if he did any artwork over there, but uh, spent, I don't know, five or six years over in England. Yeah. So that, that looks, uh, looks pretty, looks like England, except for the sunshine. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Blackpool, um, the architecture may be real, but uh, that's pretty unusual for unusual weather. Yeah, I, I spent a few months over there in the service, and I don't remember, I think maybe one or two clear days. That's the science fiction part in that. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very colorful for England. It's, you know, the, the, the colors are popping out there pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, maybe he, it was his vision for the future. That's right. In, in the future, Britain will have bright sunshine and people wearing colorful clothes. Well, yeah, you never know. We can, we can still dream. Yes. Where is Blackpool, by the way? I think it's in the Northwest, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, um, Manchester, Liverpool area of the country. But I, uh, I would have to check. I would have to check. Don't take my word on it. I'm sure that's right, because I had a war bride friend, Hilda Goodman, who was from Manchester, and her son, Georgie, used to rave about Blackpool, so they always went to Manchester, so I'm sure it's near there. Yeah, well, uh, please continue with the presentation. We will, we will look up Blackpool and uh, get you the official story. Okay. Now, in the 30s, when the Golden Gate Bridge was going up, and uh, he did a lot of cutaways and illustrations so that the people's providing the money for it could see where the money was going. 
So I'm going to see if this link to that actually, this links to, I forget what it links to now. Let's see. Hey, there it is. So you can see, uh, I think this is called a caisson. Oh, wow. I just had to unmute to say, oh, wow. <laughs> you can see the guys down there and they're, uh, looks like they're, they're dropping in framework here. And then I imagine they're pouring concrete around all of this. A couple of cranes up there. There was another one illustration I couldn't find offhand that had uh, a cutaway of one of the piers where the cables were going into the ground. That was quite the, quite the project. Would those have been uh, pressurized and the, uh, the workers in there getting, uh, getting the bends and things like that? No, uh, in, in this case, the, the, this is a concrete structure that's above the waterline. Oh, okay, so it's open to the atmosphere. Right, so they just, they just climb down there and do whatever they're doing and then, uh, I don't know much about the, the structure of construction, but I imagine once they had the, this all put together, then they would just fill this in with concrete and leave this, this unit in place and then build the pier on, build the tower on top of it. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, I do know that some caissons were underwater and they were uh, pressurized. Yeah, yeah, that's a be beautiful, beautiful picture. Uh, so you have to be an architect and an artist to put that together. Yep. But that's certainly a nice way to show the investors, hey, here's where your money's going. <laughs> right because that part didn't show that's yeah that's right that's gone when it's the bridge is done and let's see in 38 he began to do matte paintings for RKO pictures i don't know if they're still around or if they merged or something uh, and some of the the only one of these movies that i actually know anything about is or have heard about is Citizen Kane. These others I don't know. Um, I think this first one is from Citizen Kane. Now I'm not sure where the matte painting started. I think it was on the other side of this doorway, this door frame, but I'm not sure. And then this picture shows him doing a matte painting and then the painting itself. I don't know what movie this is part of. I'm doing, the, I'm doing a little math here. And if he was starting to do movie paintings in 1938 after being born in 1888, that's, uh, that's a career change at the age of 50. Yep. And, and the... Yeah, I mean, that, that's it. An inspiration to the rest of us. Yes. And uh, this was, I think, around the time he started to do uh, kind of a self-teaching on the, on the astronomical art, where he was teaching himself the geometry and perspectives and so on that would be required. Actually, this kind of looks like a radio station with an antenna on top there. And he did work on Destination Moon, War of the Worlds, some of the scenes in the beginning, some of the mad art. And then when worlds collide, he actually designed a rocket ship, which I didn't know until I picked this book up. And the, the matte painting, which has been kind of universally panned as one of the worst ever done, was actually just a study. It wasn't the final painting, but the, uh, budget on the film, they, they couldn't afford to pay him for the final artwork. So they just used the 
the concept art that he did. I actually watched, that was, uh, I think it was on Amazon it was available. I watched that a couple weeks ago. And he did work on Conquest of Space. I'm not sure exactly. I, I'm guessing it was some of the Mars scenes. And he was not happy with the, if you remember, that was a bunch of red sand and black rocks and stuff. And he was not happy with that. He didn't feel like that's what it should look like. I think it's worth noting that Destination Moon was the world's first realistic science fiction film. That wasn't based on the Hergé adventure of Tintin called Destination Moon, was it? No, it was based upon Robert Heinlein's story, Rocket Ship Galileo. Oh, that is one of my, one of, one of my more favorite books in when I was growing up. Actually, Mark, I think uh, Die Frau in Mont from the 1920s. Yeah, it was much closer to being an accurate uh, science fiction movie. Maybe I, 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 I they're they're both really uh, neglected films in, in that way, but uh, it's certainly a lot better than Georges Méliès' A Trip to the Moon. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. <laughs> And here's a technique. He, he didn't actually originate it completely. He picked it up from another artist. But he, he built a model. He would build a model of the landscape in plaster or something. He'd get, take a picture of it from whatever perspective he wanted. And then he would paint over it. So the black sky here and maybe this foreground uh, landscape and the land here was all painted in. And he probably colored this in. I imagine it was a black and white picture. So uh, I don't know if that was something he picked up from somebody that did matte painting or if he just, uh, I forget the guy that he picked it up from, but then he actually carried it forward and, and, and used it quite a lot with space art. Sounds like it could have been a movie, uh, movie technique. That's what I was thinking. Because then you could you could do your matte painting right around the uh, so that it would actually fit in really well. Yeah, if if it was like a set or part of the set. Right. And he actually did some uh, self promotion where he did some astronomical paintings, and he just out of the blue sent them to Life magazine. And they just turned around and published them straight away. Uh, that connection, they didn't, I didn't specify when, but the, it led to being introduced to Willie Lay. And around this time, he started to get his illustrations shown on science magazines. And uh, I think I've seen one issue of Coronet. Do you, anybody know what that was about, what that magazine did? I know he had he had uh, several paintings in there. I think all of these were Mechanics Illustrated, but I'm not sure. This is I don't know if anybody's ever been to this website. It's amazing. It's in Italian. Say a word. Could I say a word about Coronet? I know that magazine, and it was like Reader's Digest. It was sort of geared, I think, almost more to the female audience, but it was a general interest magazine. Oh, okay. Is that kind of like uh, Collier's or was kind right, of a, right? Yeah. Maybe a little bit more populous, more popular than than some of those. It's sort of what's the one? It's it was at the Reader's Digest level. Okay. I don't know if uh, anybody has been to this website or heard anything about it. It's uh, it's in Italian. And it's just a page after page after page of space artists like uh, Don Dixon and Bonestell and uh, 
uh, a bunch of others. It's it's really worth going to. And it's been around for a couple of decades. And then he also did miscellaneous things. This is uh, backgrounds for some menus. <laughs> So yeah, I, he did everything. He did a little bit of everything. <laughs> Just I guess whatever would pay the bills. And cost, the first first printing was in 1949 for Conquest of Space. And if you look at a lot of the paintings, he put figures in there, and that. Uh, you know, to kind of give it scale and size. You can see them down here. And in the Conquest of Space book, in the beginning of it, it shows some of the rocket ships that would get him to get the astronauts to the moon and maybe Mars. But I was always kind of disappointed that I never saw what rocket got him all the way out here. I would have liked to have seen that. But I imagine he left it out because nobody knew what, you know, not even remotely what might get out there. And I kind of looked through the, the book here and I looked at different, uh, different space art. He did paintings of the moons of Jupiter, Saturn. I think he did, I don't know if he, I don't know if he did anything for Uranus or Neptune. He, all, he also painted Pluto. There were no people in that that I could see. Oops, wrong button. So this is uh, another website that's just, just about his artwork and definitely worth a visit. And I can imagine that the, the astronauts that were in the Mercury painting, I'm sure they had suits of asbestos. And a lot of his work, a lot of work he did was in advertising. Uh, there's a painting I've seen that had a galaxy with a, um, a dark landscape. And then he had a, the uh, company that did the, that did the advertisement it was a battery, like an ever ready battery. And they had the battery coming out of the galaxy. It was really kind of goofy, but. These were a little more, a little more, uh, I don't know, professional or something. Conservative. Ah, there you go, yeah. <laughs> and it was, he kind of had a side hobby for a while in the early 50s where he was blowing up cities. Is New York here. I think this was centered on his Columbia University. I don't know what city this was, but there's, I don't know, eight or 10 paintings he's done where uh, he painted uh, atomic explosions. And as I understand it, he, ha he had reference to actual photographs that somebody provided him to show him what it looked like. Wow, that would be great for our peace group. I'll have to find those. <laughs> this is really, uh, you know, I belong to a number of anti-nuke groups and they would love this stuff. Yeah. But it's definitely not the location of Columbia University. Oh, okay. And then I've got this book somewhere, I couldn't find it. It's this giant book that Life put out called The World We Live In. Oh, I got that for Christmas that year. And I remember it, I kept leafing through it over and over. Yeah, this, this book had uh, the beginning of the earth and then it talked, it had paintings of dinosaurs and uh, after the dinosaurs were gone, some of the megafauna 
and then it went through and to the end to what they thought was how the earth would end at the at the end of things wonderful artwork in there and then uh kind of where i got first majorly exposed to Bonestell was the Collier's Magazine series. I found one of them in a uh, flea market and the, the cutaways that were in there were just magnetic for me. So then I, I picked up a lot of the magazines. I don't have them all. And from what I understand, he uh, there were two, uh, two other artists in there, Rolf Klepp and Fred Freeman. And they were the ones that did most of the cutaways, if not all of them. And the, there's a part in the Art of Jess, Chesley Bonista where the author talks about Chesley would take sketches from Von Braun or one of the other engineers, figure out how all the perspective would look from a certain point of view and get a basic scene and then hand it off to those two guys and they would do the cutaways. Now I've got here, actually, uh, there's another organization. I don't know if they're still around. They uh, reproduced the entire Collier series in high definition PDFs. And I've got a link to that, to their page where I think you can still download them. So here's, here's uh, one page out of that PDF. And this has got uh, a place where the astronauts that are going to the moon are going to be poked and prodded and analyzed. And I've got all this gear here. This was done by Fred Freeman. And sometimes in Bonestell's work and in this one particularly, there's little Cookies, I guess you'd call them. If you look down here, there's a cat. Right above that examination room text. And Bonestell did another painting in the late 60s of the crater Copernicus. And I couldn't find a picture of it on uh, handy, but there were cosmonauts that he painted in the foreground near the crater. And he put, he engraved his name into the lunar surface. And then one of them was pointing that out. So that was kind of clever. And in my, uh, I do some kind of, some antique electronic work with vacuum tubes and stuff. And if you look at some of the old Tektronics schematics, once in a while, you'll see a cookie in there where there'll be a wire traveling across the page and you'll see a little stick figure running along the wire or uh, some slanted wire going down the side and somebody on a toboggan or something. And if you get today, if you get X-ray microscope images of chips, sometimes you'll see in the dye inside the chip, people have the Pac-Man or something in there. And so this is, that's that, ish, that issue. And then we've got um, this cutaway, Fred Freeman again, of the space station. And as I understand it, Von Braun put enough work into the thought of this, that all, all of this, all of the, like this elevator that comes down this, access pipe and it's got this cage here all of the gear in here would actually could actually be brought down here and there wasn't anything you had to you know there wasn't any uh misengineering of that type where you had something you couldn't fit in there and if you look close there's a guy sitting down here in this room and he's reading a collier's magazine <laughs> And in, I've got the Collier's Magazine that follows this issue. And somebody wrote into Collier's and said, who's this gold brick guy down here in the corner?
So yeah, this is the kind of stuff that I, it was just kind of eye candy for me. And look. now this is one Bonestell did. This is said, uh, six or seven or eight rockets arriving at Mars. You can, they were very much like the rockets that uh, landed on the moon. The larger spherical tanks were dropped off. That was the boost out from Earth. They've still got the blue and the, they've still got the blue ones here on this. So I think they haven't decelerated yet because I think those tanks would have been gone. And here's another one that Bond Estelle did. He, uh, he tended to make models. He actually had a model of this, one of these moonships. And he did that so that, because some of this was really complex perspective and what was visible and wasn't. So he had a model built of it. Excuse me, could I ask everyone to mute other than the speaker? You were breaking up a little, at least at my end. The voice was breaking up. Everybody else, mute your sound, please. Okay, and the last one here. This one and this one were two spit two page spreads <clears throat> that Bonestell did. You can see the, the rocket lander being put together here. I'm not sure why the Sphere. Oh, never mind. This was attached to there. This was the the booster for the space plane. Okay. So yeah, you can if you're interested in having good copies of all of the Collier's issues, they're available online. And I put this in here because this is another one of those where this fellow right here is Von Braun. I can't really zoom in here, but if, if you zoom in there, then that's definitely his face. And there's a couple of the other engineers that were in the Collier's uh, symposium. I think they're, they're uh, painted in here as well. If I can find the reference, I'll, because somebody, somebody pointed that out to me. It wasn't me seeing it. I'll, uh, I'll pass it on. And this is one where I spent some time doing some study to find out what all the equipment in here was. And this is, so you've got a, some tapes here with an autopilot where they would land using computer tapes. Uh, flight, I think this was flight controls over here. This is an old analog computer that they would compute stuff and flight paths with and so on. This is what's called a dead reckoning tracer where they would map out uh, the path that they're on. And this is uh, more of a kind of a, a book that Willie Lay and Von uh, Chesley did that's not as common. I don't see it very much. This is my copy. And this is, uh, talks about a mission that would actually leave the entire solar system. Now, I don't, I have no clue what propulsion system they're using here. On the cover, you can see little figures here. So this, this piece here is probably about the size of a Saturn V, 30, 40 feet across. So how this piece could travel to another star was, I don't know if they went into suspended animation or uh, you know, what kind of crazy engine they were using. I don't even know, I haven't read the entire book yet, so I don't even know if they, they go into any detail. Has anybody here seen this book or have it? Yeah, I have multiple copies of that one. Oh, wow, okay. I, when I was growing up, our uh, 
town library had a copy and I would check it out two or three times a year just to kind of look at the paintings. And here we've got some links. This, if I recall, yeah, this is the link to the website that has the PDFs for Colliers. And this is their newsletter page and you can download, uh, I don't know if it's all their newsletters, but it's a ton of them. And this, I think, is the latest one, so I'm not sure if they're doing this anymore or if they're still around or what. Uh, does, does Zoom have a place where you can paste links in or chat or text or something? Because I can either provide, I'm, I'm willing to provide the PowerPoint or I can drop the links in a chat page somewhere. If you send us the PowerPoint, we will have everything. Yeah, I'll do that. You can you can add links in the chat, and and I can save that chat. I'll try to remember to save it, and well, I don't know what I do with it then. But, <laughs> but you can also give those links, and I can put them out in our next newsletter. To send an email to Gloria. Yeah, I'll, I'll and, send an email and include the PowerPoint. Now there's a couple, three YouTube videos here that I thought were interesting. Ah, uh, yes. First of all, this, this was done by a guy, I don't know, 13 years ago. And he got started on this and you'll see how far along he got. And then he just sort of fell off the planet and he had a web page up for a while but I'm, it, that's gone, and I don't exactly know what happened, but this sadly never happened. Too bad that never came about. They, they were right on with the population of the Earth. Okay, yeah, I hadn't really checked into the number. I think we're a little above 6.5 billion, but uh, um, the uh, the error is like in the uh, you know the 10 to 20 percent range. So pretty pretty close.
Now, I'm not going to, obviously, I'm not going to play this whole thing, but this is him talking about, I think, and I haven't watched the thing yet. Uh, I just happened to come across this at the last minute. Uh, this appears to be them talking about uh, stuff that was happening probably while they were doing the Collier's issues. So, kind of preview it here is the space station and kind of how it's constructed. So yeah, I still have to watch that one. Now this is a longer version. There were actually two or three trailers that this guy did of these videos and some of them were uh, pretend interviews with some of the astronauts, I believe, and engineers and stuff. This is, oh, phooey. Come on. Page this just by a cell. This uh, here's here's I got the link to the video on YouTube from here. So yeah, that if you're a Bonestell fan, this is this is just an amazing place. And I do scale models once in a while, and I picked up two of these. You've got the, uh, this is the passenger one, and it also has the parts where it had the cylinder inside with the uh, cargo section. The whole thing stands probably 10 inches tall. It doesn't include this base. And then here's a picture, one of the models that was used in the paintings. And then a call out of all the different pieces and parts. And then this is the Italian page, and this is the first page of the Bonestell section. So let's see. Yeah, I can't really tell where this is. This is this is the moon, a couple of tractors. And here is the root of the whole place. I have a question about Bonestell's illustrations of lunar landscapes. Yeah. So they're always very precipitous, uh, high terrain. Uh, and was he disappointed to see that the actual moon was a lot more uh, a gentle rolling uh, landscape and mostly flat. It did bug him. He he said that uh, he kind of based the the sharpness of his landscape on shadows of the moon. If you look at the shadows, they're pretty sharp and uh, looks like it's shadows of you know the Rocky Mountains, for example. Well, yeah. right, but. But even before uh, spaceflight, uh, we knew that the slopes on the moon were largely very gentle, just based on lunar occultation measurements. So uh, even from ground-based, we knew that the terrain on the moon was relatively uh, uh, subdued. Yeah, I don't think it really came. If I remember in reading through the the art of Chesley Bonestell, that they talk about this a little bit. And I don't think it was until some of the Mariner, not Mariner, the, uh, I forget the name of the uh, surveyor or one of the orbiters, when they actually had photographs that 
uh, showed the rolling landscape that he said, well, yeah, I guess that's kind of obvious that it would have been worn down over the millennia. But I don't think he, uh, I think that's where he it first kind of became, he became aware that it was not the way he was painting it. But yeah, he was kind of disappointed with that. He, he looked back and said, yeah, I, I guess I could have thought of that. So let's see, we've got the uh, Heinlein, a little bit of Heinlein. Frank Paul, McCall, he's another awesome artist. I like his, his use of the uh, whites and the reds and the blues in, in his rocket artwork. There's a section here on Collier's. So yeah, definitely, and this place has been around, I think about 20 years, if not more. So there we go. Let's see, how do I stop? So if, that, if that is the uh, end, I want to thank you and applause, applause. And now for further uh, comments and questions, do we have such? I, I, I wanted to just uh, um, say, you know, you brought up Destination Moon and some of the, some of the early pictures. And uh, um, I grew up with the Tintin book, Destiny Moon, where, which must have been, where the artist must have been influenced by some of the, um, you know, the scientific developments, but probably by Chesley Bonestell himself. Um, I, I never thought about, uh, you know, where the Belgian artist Hergé got his um, images and inspirations, but um, I'm, I'm thinking that we now know. Did that Tintin book, did, um, I seem to recall seeing a painting or something where there was a rocket with a bunch of scaffolding around it. Was that part of that? Definitely. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. One thing I think should be really mentioned about Chesley Bonestell and, and the people who followed on to him is that he's in the same category as those first artists who explored the American West and actually made that exploration real to the people who would never go out there. And he sort of set the stage, the psychological stage for having the, the, the uh, country willing to back Kennedy's you know, pro pro proclamation that we're going to the moon. And if you go back and look at the paintings, uh, Albert Bierstadt, Caitlin, and, and all those others, Bonestell did exactly the same thing. And he made space a real place, not a fantasy, no bug-eyed monsters. <laughs> well, seriously, you know, but really um, realistic. Okay, the slopes of the moon weren't accurate, big deal. But it, it made it into a real place, just like Bierstadt and Catlin and Remington going out to the American West, sending back pictures of Yellowstone, Yosemite, and things like that. And uh, those were, you know, those, those were landscapes which were absolutely fantastic to people who'd never been in the American West. The, the people in New England had never seen the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and so Bonestell really made this possible that when somebody comes along like Von Braun and John Kennedy and all the others who pushed the American space program, it made it realistic to the public. And I think provided a, a real amount of, uh, you know, political support, if you will, because he made it real to them. Yeah, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't correlated that with the uh, heading west aspect. <clears throat> oh, I, I want to bring up, um, I forget what his first name is. His last name is Vetter, and he spoke at our group over a year ago. I'm trying to get back to the full screen here. And you keep dropping into the little small, wait a minute. <laughs> there you are. Okay. Um, Jonathan Vetter, I can't remember his name, but it, it was called Fieldwork. And the last name of the writer is V-E-T-T-E-R. 
and it was science in the era of railroading about how there were some people who were working on the technologies of surveying and telegraphy who were open to the local knowledge of the people. And I think we're going to have him come again and talk about this because these grand knowledge constructions of a global system also have to deal with people's micro knowledge on the site. And anyway, the man's name is Vetter and I think he's in history, I'm not sure, but it deals with science and technology and how they did draw on the knowledge, some of them, not all, of the Native Americans who lived on the land. And normally science just rolls over all these different, it's now called cultural economies. They just steamroll them. So this is where the rubber meets the road, so does the Native Americans included. And that's also in Ray Bradbury. Um, you know, he brings in all the technology and the things that Chesley Bonestell did and, and the others who were writing like Heinlein, but he brings in the other dimension of the local knowledges of the places that you're going. Whereas we have our colonizer knowledge. Okay, we're taking that out into space, but there are also, there's a pushback and that's the local knowledges. And I think everybody, don't you agree, Tay? Everyone who reads science fiction knows that, that there's pushback knowledge from these other, um, you could call it the others, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Yeah, it, there's, I can think of a number of stories where uh, the locals in a science fiction story are, uh, get involved in, in the visitors. There's an excellent story by Nina Horvath. It was a group, it was a, a group we put together to put out a, a collection called Planet Europa SF. And she's from Viria and a young science fiction writer, Nina Horvath. If you type it in, I think she has a website. She wrote a beautiful story. I wish we had gotten our book published. And it was called Sense of Sense of Smell. It had something to do with smell because she said there in Vienna, She'd been overrun with uh, little critters, you know, cockroaches or some kind of critters or ants. And she had to have them eradicated. So that made her think about a planet of creatures that were, you know, from the insect family. And everything is based on a sense of smell so that the, the earth critters who come with their scientific knowledge don't know exactly how to meet this other group. And they have to be very careful to wear scent because when you have fear, that's when they will pounce on you, these other creatures. I'll try to keep this quick. And so they have to have these tacks of disguising scent so that they can't smell them, the astronauts. And one of them gets caught without it, but he manages to somehow connect with, you know, there's this bridge character of one of these little creatures that somehow they connect. And he learns, oh, oh, I see. So this is before they have the packs to disguise their scent and that's so he learns about that and then he finds near the end of the story that the insects are making fake packs to put on their back they're learning there's something here to that's a weapon and we'll, we're going to build these packs too and the final comment is i think we've just we've just introduced sin because they were unable to disguise they couldn't lie because their scent always said exactly what they were thinking. So they couldn't say, I'm thinking A and really be intending B. The scent made them honest all the time. And so the astronaut said, I think we've introduced lying and sin to this planet. Huh. They were gonna start disguising their scent. They never had done that. So this is something that's a bit different, you know, and, and these are the ways that we interact with this other part that isn't our rockets and our technology. There's a lot of pushback on that now from, from indigenous people who write science fiction. In fact, we have one coming in March. Her name is Grace Dillon, and she teaches in, in indigenous studies at Portland State University. And uh, she has been the editor of a, a book for our here in Arizona, University of Arizona Press called Walking the Clouds, the first indigenous collection 
of science fiction. So her title of her talk in March is going to be Writing Science Fiction While Indigenous. So that'll be, you know, sort of a, a counterpoint to this man conquers space, you know, man, Western man, Western white man. I won't belabor the topic here. Well, I didn't know that anything like that had been written. Yeah, see, that's that's one thing that you'd think because we're in science, we'd have this really good network. Well, dealing with the European fan for that book. And see, my late husband was a citizen of Sweden, so I had some interest in the fandom over there. I knew some of those people. And I found we don't know anything that's going on in Europe, and, and let alone, and then I discovered that Grace, somehow she found out about my the collection that we were doing on Ray Bradbury called Orbiting Ray Bradbury's Mars. And she wrote uh, uh, an essay in that book that came out in 2012 about reading the Martian Chronicles, you know, which is an allegory about the conquest of space, or the conquest of Mars by Earthlings. And she said it gave her great hope and it built up her morale reading it on the reservation and off as she was growing up. And, and she explains all that in, in her essay in Orbiting Ray Bradbury's Mars. So uh, the anthropological, if you will, or cultural economic side of space exploration is something that we hope to encompass all these. You see, we're encompassing this view, but then we're bringing in some other aspects as well. I hope everybody likes that. <laughs> Just went ahead and did it, but you're welcome. Any of you, Tay, I mean, you're new to the group and Mark, if you know people you think would be interesting presenters. Uh, I think I'm booked up now through October of 2022. No, wait, let me look at that. October of 2022, but people do cancel out. And, you know, uh, are you are you on our mailing list, Mark? This is just a fast queue. Uh, I, I run, but uh, thanks so much. Okay, it's wonderful. Bruce, yeah, it's wonderful to have you. And Anyone who isn't on the mailing list, such as Mark, I don't know if you are, you can be added to our list. And then you get the whole list of all the speakers up through next October. But I didn't I know have about you until Gary emailed me this past week. So uh, okay. you're, you're brand new to me. I want to thank the speaker. It's a very nice job. Um, we're all from a generation who understands what his name is and what it means. A teenager wouldn't know what a slipstick is anymore. <laughs> That's true. Nope. I showed, I have a friend who has a 17 year old just went off to college for the first time. He's going to be studying engineering. He's very sharp. He speaks three languages already. And I showed it by slide rule and he was absolutely flummoxed. <laughs> yeah, sure. But, but well, if you want to do a follow up, let me suggest that you do something about the people that Bonestell inspired. The space artists like Bob McCall, Don Dixon, Kim Poor, Helmut Wimmer, you know, all, all of those guys. And uh, Don right Cowan. Behind, see that picture right, right behind Cowan. me? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's from Helmut Wimmer. Um, mm -hmm. And who well, also there's a number, the of, there's more than you can count, actually. Yeah, there, there are a lot of them, but they're very interesting and they vary in their fidelity to facts and things like that. But it, it would be a good follow-up at, at some point in the future. And thank you for letting me be here. Yeah, thanks for being here. Fine, and, and you know, I really would like to uh, open it up. Karen, do you have anything you'd like to the other women who came? Because <laughs> the men tend to. Hi. Um... I really didn't know about um, uh, about Chester Botswell, so I really appreciate this. And just uh, and because I don't know what struck one of the things that struck me was that what he's most famous for is a picture of Saturn, and that was the first thing that he saw through a telescope. So, you know, I just sort of related that. That was kind of interesting and. I write poetry, so it'll be in a poem someday. <laughs> and thank you. It was a really interesting, um, really interesting discussion. And I'll be looking up some of those links. And the, the film that you told me about, I didn't know it existed. I have Amazon Prime, and I really look forward to seeing that. 
So thanks a I lot. Thanks for watching. We'll be watching it sure. today, I think. Now that we get to our attention. What about Nancy? Are you still here, Nancy? We haven't heard anything from Nancy. Well, maybe she's still here, you know, but out or something. Anyway, uh, this has been so exciting because it's one of the first times, for one thing, that I think I got the tech together and I will be able to save everything correctly. So uh, this should be up in a day or two if I'm on top of things. I'll get the initial bad parts uh, you know, taken off. And this is only our second video in our, on our new um, YouTube channel. So I want to thank you for that allowing me to learn at your expense, Tay, but, yeah. and tell all the people in Denver, you know, that I, I lived in Denver for a year. I was at National Jewish Hospital. I had asthma and on, it was 3,800 Colfax, and I still remember. So uh, I hope you will all get in touch with us. I mean, we should, as you said, Tay, we should be more connected. I mean, all kinds of other groups are very connected, but considering the, the ones who are supposed to be looking at the future, I think it, we should have these channels where it's live and then you can also have it archived. Thank you so much. This was very professionally done and I appreciate your effort in putting this on. So oh, that wasn't boring. Got to run too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and I'm not going to end, so I'm going to stay and not do anything stupid like end, because <laughs> then we wouldn't have it recorded. We wouldn't get the, the chat anyway. I'm trying to figure out. I don't know if there was much chat at this time. Save. Oh, I'll show you. I have a whole pup tent here to remind myself. So. Let's see if it says save recording. Stop. Well, goodbye, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording, but that doesn't mean, Tay, you have to leave. I'll say yes.